In 2010, a bunch of my family traveled to the Philippines for my cousin's wedding. Among my family from the U.S., only my cousin Tracy brought along a plus one, her boyfriend Kip. As a tall white guy, he stood out like a sore thumb among us short Filipinos. And unfortunately for him, that meant that he got a little hazing from our relatives. Going to um, Auntie Bless's, what was it, her mother's house? Where they were offering me a chicken to kill right away. I was just like, like here, have, have, have a fresh meal. Try to kill this chicken. Oh my god, oh no! Oh, oh, oh. Of course, I couldn't do that. And then, uh, then her mother came up and just like took care of the chicken in like a second, and just kind of looked at me and was like, "Silly dude from America, you can't, you can't kill a chicken." <laughs> Hello, I'm Lionel Nicolau. And I'm Alana White. And this is Culture Jumpers, stories about making the jump from one cultural context to another. Today on the show, tales of joy, embarrassment, and more from people who've made the jump to become honorary Asians. So Alana, I'm really excited about this episode because I wanted to talk about white people who've been around Asians long enough that they've sort of themselves become honorary Asians. And who better to start with than my wife? Does that mean I made the cut? Yeah, I think you've earned the title, but we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, So you're Jewish and I'm half Chinese, half Filipino. I've always felt like we were a pretty unique couple given our backgrounds, but you pointed out that that's not necessarily true. Yeah, I wouldn't call it common, but there are definitely Asian Jewish couples out there. And when you're talking about Asian white couples, we're not even unique in your own family. Your mom and brother are both married to white spouses. You know what's kind of funny? When we all go out to dinner together, it's like we're the Brady Bunch or something, except none of the white people are actually related to each other. (laughs) Yeah, I remember the first time you pointed that out, I was like, Brady Bunch, huh? And then it clicked and I was like, oh, I get it. And after that, we started to look at photos of my extended family from all the recent weddings that we've been to. And we realized there were a lot of white spouses. Yeah, it's got to be at least half a dozen at this point. Yeah. And that got us thinking. So we hear all the time about Asians and immigrants in general trying to assimilate into white culture. But you don't really hear much about white people assimilating into Asian culture. So we're going to flip the script a little bit and ask all the white people who've married Asians what it's like trying to fit into the cultures of their spouses. What do they think of the food, the language differences? What customs and rituals do they need to learn? We're going to cover all of that. And the first person we're going to talk to about it is you, Alana. So when we first met, I was still a senior in college, living on campus, and I remember one of the first things that I cooked for you was Filipino spaghetti. Do you remember that? I think it was like our third date, and you were like, you should come over to my dorm and I'll cook for you. And I was like, okay. And then I walk in and you're like, I'm going to make you Filipino spaghetti. I'm like, okay, how's that different from regular spaghetti? And you were like, just, just wait. And then I saw you, you start taking like ground meat out of the fridge and then you take out this like bottle that it looks like ketchup, but not ketchup. And then you start bringing out hot dogs. And I'm like, what in the world is happening here? (laughs) Um, And it actually ended up being quite delicious. Um, Yes. Super, super unhealthy, which seems to be my experience of Filipino food. (laughs) Um, And I discovered that the not ketchup ketchup was actually banana ketchup. Somehow they puree bananas and make it red, and it tastes kind of like ketchup, but sweeter. So it's just like a really sweet spaghetti with chunks of hot dog in it. But you don't do the cheese, which... Yeah, I made it healthy for you. (laughs) So healthy. I don't know why, but that's kind of where I drew the line. You were like, usually people sprinkle a bunch of cheese on top. And I was like, that's that's just too much. I don't... Is it because of the Jewish meat and cheese thing? I mean, not really, because I had been eating like chicken parm and all kinds of unkosher stuff for decades at that point. Well, I don't think you really experienced Filipino food in a big way until you came with me to one of our family reunions for Christmas one year. I think it was a couple years after we started dating. Well, I mean, I had known your 
and uncle for a few years at that point because you were living with them at the time. So like I had experienced Filipino food, but I don't think I experienced like the whole feast Mm -hmm. of all the different dishes. Which dishes do you remember? There's always lumpia, which I appreciate because those things are addictive. So lumpia is kind of the Filipino version of an egg roll. And it's usually got some minced meat and I guess usually like some vegetables inside. But they're like smaller. They're almost more like taquitos than (laughs) egg rolls. There is some dinaguan, which is blood pudding, I guess. But it's not like in sausage form, like just liquid. It looks like a bowl of melted chocolate, but it's pig's blood. I don't remember if I tried it before someone told me what it was or not. But once I knew what it was, I was like, uh, uh, I don't. <laughs> but I mean, I grew up eating chopped liver because my family's Jewish. So it's not that weird. Mm-hmm. It was more just like, oh, man, if my grandfather could see me now. <laughs> It's a very pork-heavy cuisine. It is a lot of pork and a lot of seafood, neither of which Jewish people eat. So, but I mean, like, again, at that point, we stopped keeping kosher when I was probably in middle school. So it wasn't like shocking or antithetical to the way that I lived my life. It was just more so like I didn't really grow up eating those things. I haven't really acquired a taste for it. So it's like I'll eat pork and I'll eat seafood sometimes, but it's like not my preferred meal. Yeah, I kind of feel bad looking back now because the whole time that we were there, I was so preoccupied with, you know, oh my gosh, I'm sharing my culture, you know, with my girlfriend and all these things I love, I want to share with her. And I just completely didn't think about like, oh, she might be a little bit uncomfortable with the fact that I'm just shoving a bunch of pork onto her plate and growing up Jewish, she might not be used to that. I mean, that's one of the things that like I I kind of find interesting about our relationship in particular, because if I was more devout and you were more devout, we probably wouldn't work. (laughs) I think it's because neither of us really care and it's just more of our extended family that are religious, that it's fine. Yeah, I mean, I feel like one of the better examples of that is, you know, we've gone to quite a few weddings in our family at this point, and some of them have been Catholic weddings. And so we have to go to mass for the first part of the ceremony. And I think the first one was probably my brother's wedding. What do you remember about that experience? So I grew up in middle school. My best friend, her family were evangelical Christians. So I'd had a little bit of experience by that point of going to church, but I don't think I'd ever been to like a Catholic mass. But in a way, I feel like Catholic services are sort of familiar in a strange way to Jewish services just because like it's all very ritualistic. It's a lot more structured than some of the like Protestant and evangelical church services that I've gone to. But I will say like at the end when it comes time for like communion, The specific church that your brother got married in, they had everybody line up at the back of the pews and sort of make their way up. And I don't know if we couldn't opt out or we felt like we couldn't opt out, but I looked at you and you're like, I guess get in line. And I was like, well, what what do I do? Like, I was like having a, like a panic attack. And you're like, just cross your hands over your arms. And I'm like, like Dracula? And you're like, yeah, pretty much. Like, just go up there and shake your head at the priest and just like, keep walking. I was like okay. And so that's what we did. And I think that was just the one point where it was like a little bit uncomfortable for me because I was like, they're asking me to actively participate. So like, I had that moment of like deer in headlights where I was like, I don't know what to do here. And then I remember a couple of years later, when uh, your cousin John John got married, it was also a Catholic service. And it was kind of the same deal, like at the end of the service, okay, everybody come up to communion, blah, blah, blah. I think you and I ended up just kind of staying in our seats in the pew. And I was like, phew, this is so much less stressful than that last time. And then at the end, the priest gets back up and he's like, we did really well today. I think about 98% of you took communion. And I was just like, oh, (laughs) we're literally the 2%. We've been together for a while now. You've had a lot of interactions with my family, with my mom, my brother, 
And I was wondering, is there anything culturally that confused you that, you know, maybe I had to explain to you or cause some misunderstanding? I remember like when I first started hanging out with your family and any time one of your aunts or uncles or your mom would be talking about somebody else, they would constantly be mixing up the pronouns he and she. And this was like before the pronoun discussions happening on a larger cultural basis right now. Right. But it, it was just like... If your mom was talking about your Uncle Ron or something, she would say something like, Oh, I saw Uncle Ron the other day, and she was on her way to a wedding. And I would be like, what? what? Wait, what? What is happening that this is, like, so confusing? Like, all of these people have been in the U.S. long enough, and they have a good enough grasp of English that I don't get why this is confusing. And it wasn't until years later when I took a Tagalog class that I realized oh, Tagalog does not have gender pronouns at all. So like, it's just a concept that doesn't make sense to them. And it was like a light bulb went off and I was like, oh, that makes so much more sense now. Really? So how does it go? How do you say like, he is John? So there's like a gender neutral third person pronoun, Sha. Uh -huh. You can tell me if I'm butchering the pronunciation, but it's S-I-Y-A. And it's kind of the equivalent of they or that person. Mm -hmm. And so you would say sha, si, which is like a an article that goes along with pronouns, and then the person's name. And so it's like every sentence, you either have to pick it up from context of the other words, or you're familiar with who that person is. And so it's kind of implied. But there's no direct way to do it just with pronouns. By the way, I'm not just playing dumb. <laughs> I actually don't know Tagalog. But you took a Tagalog class, and so that's why I have to lean on you to teach me. I did take a Tagalog class, and I learned enough to get by for about a month or so, and I have since forgotten everything. <laughs> Actually, you know, one that came up recently that I think you and I were both laughing about is there was this Jeopardy contestant who made the national news for winning several games in a row, but made our local news because they were from Philly. And your mom had been like texting both of us and was like, oh, have you watched Jeopardy? This contestant is really good. She's very smart. And I was like confused because all the articles that I had read was talking about this contestant being male. And then I was like, oh, it's that pesky pronoun thing again. Yeah, so I, I think she was talking about Ryan Long. He was a rideshare driver from Philly. Very much male. <laughs> but when my mom texted us, he's saying, she looks very smart. <laughs> Which also, I don't know how you look smart, but that's a whole separate thing. <laughs> um, so any other funny language quirks that you ran into with my family? I feel like it's mostly you and your immediate family, and I don't know... Well, well, just um, my family, right? Not me. I mean, my grammar is pretty perfect. Oh, oh no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> you picked up weird isms from your mom. What? Yes. Yeah. So you're always saying things like, how do they look like? That's right. The proper way of phrasing it? No, the proper way of phrasing it is, what do they look like? And for some reason, you always use how? That's right. No, it is not. <laughs> the other thing that drives me a little crazy is we'll drive to the store and we always have our dog with us so one of us stays in the car while the other person goes shopping and you'll always look at me and be like so do you want to go down to the store or like you'll say like get down from the car yeah that's it's get out of the, the car what's wrong with that it's get out of the car well so when you open the door or the car what do you do you step down from an elevated position onto the floor and That's, then you... <laughs> you also you use floor for every surface that you walk on whether it is inside or outside ground is not a word that is in your vocabulary what well they're synonyms though they're kind of but not really they are at least in american english floor implies an inside space and ground implies something outside yeah but i feel like if you look it up you'll see that they're synonyms Synonyms are not identical. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean that they're interchangeable 100% of the time. I don't know about that one. You also tell me to close the lights. No, I don't. Right. Yes, you do. No, I say turn it off. No, you don't. I, I, I don't think I say that. Yes, you do. I'm quite conscious of that one. You slip up sometimes.
for our next guest, we'll be talking to the veteran white guy in Lionel's family. Yeah, you might recognize him from the top of the episode. My name is Kip Hensley, and I am an engineer that works in the renewable energy sector, currently located in Oakland, California. So Kip is married to my cousin Tracy, and they started dating around 2004, and he was the first white person to join the family. So he's been around the longest, and I thought he might have the most insight into what it's like being around our Filipino family as this outsider coming in. You know, one thing that's always been confusing for me is just the family dynamic. So I'm your typical white guy. I guess if you wanted to go with background, I'm Norwegian, English, with some Italian. And so when we have family gatherings, Christmas might be eight to 10 people. That's a big gathering for us. Yeah. And when I've gone to any of Tracy's, even just a random like Tuesday evening, there's still like 15 people at (laughs) Tracy's mom's house. Uh And um, everyone is an auntie and an uncle. And that has, like, since day one, confused me and annoyed me because I'm like, I want to know who is actually blood and who's just a friend that became an auntie. And what does it take to become an auntie? Did you ever have conversations with Tracy about, like, hey, like, who's related and who's not? I've tried. And she's like, I actually don't know. And there's times (laughs) where, like, she's like, I actually don't know if that person is blood related or not. Uh And there's no hard and fast rules. It's just like. If you know their name and they aren't a bad person, they become your auntie and uncle. (laughs) It's so confusing. And so Uh, that that is easily one of the biggest differences for myself is that just appreciating that kind of bond and that safety net that it seems like Tracy's culture really has that mine didn't. Kip also came with our family to visit the Philippines for my cousin Not Not's wedding. And that trip turned out to be quite a culture shock for him. I guess we've been together already like five years. Right. So I'm starting to feel like I'm an honorary Filipino, right? I've been over to to Malou's house in Oceanside many times. I've hung out with you guys and all the cousins a bunch of times. So I'm like, okay, I got this. Hmm. Well, I was not ready for the Philippines. (laughs) Oh man. I mean, there's just, there's so many instances where I just felt like this clown in someone else's movie. You know, I think one that stood out, this was your cousin, not not sweating. Yes. Which I don't know if it's a real, it is a real cut. This is a blood cousin. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, so cousin not not sweating. And one of the things that uh, I really wanted to do was try to dress in the way that a lot of Filipinos will dress when it's a formal setting. Uh-huh. And so what the men often wear is like this mesh shirt called a barong, which made a lot of sense to me because the Philippines was hot and it was humid. And I was like, cool. So this thing is like, it's mesh. It's going to breathe. This is going to be great at this like 90 degree Fahrenheit, 90% humidity wedding. And Uh so, you know, Tracy's family actually got me like a perfectly fitting barong, which is hard because I'm like six foot three and a lot of barongs don't go that long. (laughs) But anyway, I'm like putting it on. I'm like, oh, this is going to breathe so nicely. And so I come out of the bathroom to a room of a lot of folks that were getting ready for the wedding. And Mm -hmm. when I get out there, I just notice a couple of people pointing and then they start laughing. I'm like, what, what's so funny? <laughs> and, and people are looking at my chest. And I look down. I'm like, I'm wearing the barong. And finally, someone comes up and like, you're supposed to wear an undershirt with your barong. <laughs> I'm like, what? Because I, you know, I'm showing, I'm just wearing this mesh shirt. So obviously everything's showing through. And so it looks just yeah. silly because as I look around, I notice every other male is wearing a barong with an undershirt. No one's showing off their chest. Uh-huh. I was like, oh, this is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> but in my mind, it's like, well, this thing's mesh. I don't want to wear a cotton undershirt because it defeats the whole purpose. But right. Learn the hard way through public embarrassment that that is not how you wear a formal <laughs> attire in the form of barong. I wish I could say that all of our experiences during that trip were as fun and lighthearted as that one, but unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Being a white American in the Philippines led to some darker moments for Kip as well. There was an incident where the house that we were renting, it's sort of in this suburban development, and there was a misunderstanding with the security guard at the gate. I was wondering, do you remember that? How could I forget? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was in a van with yourself and quite a few of the aunties and uncles, and I remember I was in the front seat, passenger seat. Um, it was like probably, I don't know, 10 of us in an eight-person van so we had to like double up on some seats and so tracy Mm -hmm. was sitting on my lap in the front passenger seat your oldest uncle og was Mm -hmm. in the van with us 
And mm -hmm. um, as we pull into the complex, they have a guard at the gate to make sure that they control who comes in and out. Uh -huh. And for whatever reason, again, with all my Tagalog understanding, everything was over my head. But there was obviously more than just, hello, which room are you staying at? The conversation was going for a while and it started getting a little heated to the point where I remember your, your uncle OG jumping out and like <laughs> getting in the guard's face. Oh, man. And there was a lot of pointing at me and at Tracy. And I was like, well, what the, what's going on here? This is not a very friendly environment. And all we're trying to do is just go to our rooms. Right. And um, I remember after the fact, kind of asking everyone what went down. And uh, the general gist was that they didn't want to let our van in because of what potentially they perceived Tracy to be. They see a white guy with a Filipino woman, and they instantly think of a business transaction, of, of a hired service. Uh -huh. And so they didn't allow that at this particular establishment. And so they just instantly assumed there's no way that these two are actually together and are actually in love. And I just was blown away because I was like, how is that the first assumption? <laughs> you don't start with, yeah, they're probably together. But no, their first assumption was like, oh, yeah, so this guy just hired her. and. Uh, They'll be together for however long, the next hours or days, and then you know, they'll part ways or whatever. And, you know, it went further. I don't know if you were told the rest of the story the next morning, but so Tracy went down to like the lobby area to get breakfast. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Tracy growing up in the home where her mom and dad spoke Tagalog, she understood Tagalog like perfectly. Right. And so she's also was while there was trying to practice and she felt her Tagalog really picking up being in the environment for however long we we're there at that point, already a week. And so she was practicing her Tagalog with the um, people at the restaurant down the lobby. And they were looking at her funny and they wouldn't respond back to her initially. And, and at first Tracy was thinking, well, maybe my Tagalog's not landing right. Mm. But then they started responding back with like, you know, we don't serve your kind here. You shouldn't be here. Oh. Yeah. And Tracy was like, what? And so then she switches it up to English. And it's very clear. It's like fluent American English. Right. And the people just look confused. And this is all, I'm telling this through Tracy's eyes as she told me. And they're still like just confused but not serving her. And then I come down like five, ten minutes later after this engagement started not knowing anything that's going on. And so I just go up, you know, give her a kiss on the cheek. I'm like, oh, what are you having? And uh, they're looking at me and they're looking at Tracy. And then they ask like, oh, are, are you guys together? And I was like, yeah. Yeah, why is this so weird for people <laughs> to comprehend that we are just a couple trying to get breakfast? Oh my God. Uh... And so, you know, I think from Tracy's perspective, it was, I think, a lot more insulting yeah. because she was the one being assumed to be this type of worker. Definitely. And so I, I know that that was a lot harder for her but looking back, I kind of appreciate the story because it was a really deep insight for myself anyway, that not everyone lives in a super comfortable environment with a nine to five job that you go to. Where a lot of people have kids and have to feed your family and you do what you have to do. So at the end of the day, I think we kind of had more of a softer view of it than when we initially were not allowed into the complex or Tracy wasn't served breakfast. It's been over 10 years since that trip to the Philippines, and contrary to that security guard's very mistaken beliefs, Kip and Tracy are still going strong. They're now married, and they have two kids. One thing I wanted to mention was your father now. So how's that been? It's the best. I couldn't be happier. Um, it's, it's a lot of work, but I have a, you know, a three-year-old daughter, Sloan, and a one-year-old son, Dash, and they are just the best. Well, I guess that begs the question, who among your friends are going to become their uncles and aunties? <laughs> it's kind of funny. I feel like we're doing exactly what I got confused by <laughs> in the sense that um, every one of my good friends that uh, live in the adjacent area, Tracy, and now I find myself doing the same. We introduce them as like, oh, Sloan, here's Uncle Gary, or here's Uncle Enzo. Or here's Uncle Dan. And I'm like, oh my God, we're doing the same thing. They totally confused me. We're making all these <laughs> non-blood related people, aunties and uncles. So it's kind of funny. We're already maybe bringing some of that Filipino culture to the kids without me even really thinking about it.
So for our next interview, we're getting some help from someone we mentioned quite a bit in the last segment, my cousin Tracy. Welcome. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about our next guest? Well, when you told us that you were working on this project, Kip and I realized that we actually knew quite a few couples who were specifically white and Filipino. And so I reached out to one of my good friends, Kaylee. My name's Kaylee Carino. I am living in Oakland, California now. I'm an occupational therapist. Um, I work in the hospital setting. And yeah, I work teaching people that have had different disabilities how to do their basic daily skills. So Kaylee is a good friend of mine who I initially met through my college friend, Gary, who happens to be Filipino. And they had this very unique meet cute, if you will. And I just love hearing them share their story. So Gary and I actually met on the freeway on Highway 5 in Orange County. I was in a car with a bunch of my girl and guy friends. We were all like smashed in the sedan. And we look to our right and we see another car full of guys driving right next to us. So we were in traffic, we slowed down, and we ended up putting our phone number through a receipt through the window. And they called us. And they're like, oh, come hang out with us in San Diego. And so we ended up going over to their house that night. But we didn't even actually start dating then. Um, we were both visiting friends in San Diego after about a year. And we re-met then, kind of continued our relationship through that summer. We kind of kept going when I was in Korea, long distance. And after I was done with my teaching contract, we eloped in Thailand. And that was... 10 years ago this year. To rewind a bit, the summer before Kaylee moved to Korea, they spent a lot of time together, and that's when she met Gary's parents. What were your thoughts on that first meeting? Um, how do you think it went, and, and what was your reaction to them, and how do you think they initially reacted to you? Yeah, I remember feeling nervous when I met Gary's mom and dad, like, the first time. Afterwards, I do remember having this thought of, like, oh, I wonder what she thinks about us being in a relationship if she minded that I was not Filipino. I did have that thought, and I remember bringing it up to Gary in the beginning, but he just said she wouldn't care, he wouldn't care. I remember him telling me that Filipinos have like this way of assimilating into cultures, and they've been doing it all around the world for long periods of time, and that Filipinos are very like welcoming people, and anybody who's wanting to join their family is like an extended family member to them. What sort of thoughts have you had around raising kids here in the U.S., you know, specifically kids that are biracial? Have there ever been any concerns around that? Yeah, definitely, actually. I I always have, I have this fear, I guess, that people will not see the kids as mine or that I'm the nanny or wonder, like, why is she with those kids? I know that, you know, Gary's definitely a lot, his skin color is a lot darker than mine. And so... I know they'll probably be tanner than me and maybe look, I guess in my mind, more like Gary, I guess more the Asian gene is strong. So I think they'll probably look pretty Filipino, which is no problem to me. I love, you know, but I think it's like our natural instinct to want to like have our children look like us. So people know that they're ours. I guess that's more of my fear. It's not how I'll perceive the children, but maybe how other people will look at me. Right. Not everyone would be quite as open or receptive to that potentially. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, my husband has blonde hair and blue eyes, literally the opposite of me. And so when he walks around with our kids, he's actually had people comment, oh, your wife must be ethnic. Yes. And for him, it's like, well, these are my kids regardless. And it doesn't matter what they look like or what my wife looks like. They're just my kids. And yeah. I think sometimes he struggles with those encounters. Wait, 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 hold up. Aren't they basically saying your kids don't look white enough to be his? I mean, yeah, pretty much. It's almost infuriating. Do people ever say that to you or in front of you? Or is it just something that white people only say when you're not there? You know, so far, it's really only happened when I wasn't present. Um, I think that it's primarily because they see a white guy with brownish kids uh, without a mom around. So they have to make a quick assumption. Uh, so that's typically how it works out. But I'm trying to think like, 
your wife must be ethnic. Like, why does the word ethnic feel so gross? Because I think using the word ethnic means anyone who's not like Wonder Bread White. I think it highlights that they're like, quote unquote, the other. Yeah, I think that's right. And historically, ethnic has been used as a way to separate people out and make them feel like they don't belong. For a long time, Jews were considered ethnic until they were deemed white enough. And I'm sure people use the term today thinking it's like more PC or correct than other terms. But as you said, Tracy, it really just makes people feel other. So Alana, does that mean you're also ethnic? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely still places in America where I would be considered ethnic because as a Jewish person, I will never truly belong. So does that mean our kids would be double ethnic? <laughs> no, I think that means your kids would be exotic. Oh, right. Exotic. I mean, we joke, but that's sort of the other side of the coin. There are the people who dislike you for being ethnic, but then there are the people who will fetishize your children for being exotic. That's really gross. Is that something that you experience with your kids, Tracy? Oh, absolutely. And surprisingly, on both sides of the spectrum. So on one side, you have Filipinos who are ogling at how beautifully light-skinned my half-white children are. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have non-Filipinos admiring their exotic tan skin. Like, what? <laughs> it's just such a strange phenomenon. You know, Lionel, it's not something that you and I have really spent a ton of time talking about since we both knew pretty early on that kids weren't in the cards for us. But I'm sure if we did have kids, we'd get similar comments. I've had tons of conversations with people who know we're not having kids and, you know, usually they're cool with it. But like every now and then they'll be like, but aren't you just curious what your kids would look like? And I'm like, yeah, let me bring a whole being into the world and be responsible for their care for 18 years. Just so nosy auntie over here can decide if they're cute enough. And then, like, what happens when they're like, oh, it's too Asian looking or too white looking. I don't like it. Yeah, I definitely sympathize with the happy kids. Like, it probably doesn't feel great to get talked about. Like, you're some dog breeders doodle mix. So far, we've covered Kaylee having to navigate joining Gary's family and dealing with her fears that she wouldn't fit in. But that turned out not to be a problem. In fact, Kaylee having a Filipino spouse actually helped her gain a family at work. I work in Daly City, so Daly City is filled with Filipinos. But healthcare in general is there's Filipinos everywhere from, you know, being nurses, which is like, I think, a more standard profession for a lot of Filipinos. But I have so many therapist coworkers that are Filipino, case managers, social workers, doctors. There's a lot of Filipinos in healthcare. And it's not just in the Bay Area. It's also true across the U.S. It's like a joke that LPN doesn't stand for licensed practical nurse, but little Filipina nurse. And it's because in the 60s, the U.S. made this concentrated effort to recruit nurses specifically from the Philippines to deal with the labor shortage here. Since that time, over 150,000 Filipino nurses have come to the U.S., and that's not even including other healthcare professions or American-born Filipinos. It's kind of funny, actually. I've worked at many facilities, many hospitals, many different rehab facilities, and once people find out that I'm married to somebody Filipino-American, they treat me differently. It's like I'm part of their little family now. We have to do interdisciplinary team meetings with like the doctors and the case managers and stuff. And after the meeting, we're just standing there and one of the case managers, he turned to the other Filipino social worker and he's like, hey, she's one of us. She's married to one of us. Was there an example in particular where like that extra bond was really helpful on like a really difficult day? Honestly, I think in that case, it's more with the patients. I work with so many Filipino patients as well. Probably, I don't even know, like maybe like half the patients I see on a daily basis are Filipinos. So I'll have them do like very private things like going to the bathroom and, you know, things that might feel uncomfortable at times, but, you know, just add a little Tagalog in there and they'll just, you know, smile like, I'm like, oh, Maganda, come on, you know, like, I think it just adds this patient relationship that I, that's unique. I think it helps me connect with patients in a way that I wouldn't otherwise be able to. 
that's what changes people's experiences, like how you interact with them. And as a therapist, I get to spend an extended period of time that a lot of people don't get to. And these people are going through very crazy things at times, very hard things, life-changing things. And to have somebody that's helping them, teaching them new things, new skills. Maybe I just ask them where they're from. Maybe they'll think of me as that therapist that really took the extra mile to get to know them more. Mm -hmm. Have any of the patients expressed that to you, like that they felt that it was really helpful to have that bond with you? Not necessarily. I think not to say that they don't think that. A lot of the times these patients are not in a mind state or a physical ability to do that. But yeah, I feel it though sometimes. You know, I, I had this little 90 year old lady um, the other day that we got her up and she's sitting in the chair and I gave her this comb and she was like combing her hair. And then I was just like, oh, Maganda, you know, like, man, she just smiled and she was happy. And she was in a COVID isolation room. Her daughter's like outside the window. She can't come inside, you know? So just that smile, like, you can just add a little bit to somebody's experience, maybe in that moment. It's like a child. They might not be able to express exactly how they're feeling, but there's like a feeling inside that they get that maybe they're just like an emotion that might help them in their recovery or something like that. Today's episode of Culture Jumpers was hosted by Alana White and me, Lino Nicolau. We're produced and edited by myself and Alana White. And special thanks to our contributing producer, Tracy Hensley. Our music and sound design is by Alana White. This is actually part one of a two-part series. In the next episode, we'll talk to some more white people who've married Asians. He like climbed on this huge boulder, like 10 feet up. And her mom was like, Marapaka! And I'm like, what did she call him? <laughs> what, what did she just call him? <laughs> Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Uh, uh.